Hi everyone, welcome to Miss Adams Teachers Macbeth. Today we are looking at Act 4, Scene 1. Okay, so this scene is all about the witches and the prophecies that they are going to tell Macbeth. The scene begins in a similar desolate place with that same thunder and lightning that introduces the witches every time we see them. And they are very clearly casting a spell. There is a brief show up from Hecate, which we'll talk about um, shortly, um, and then Macbeth arrives. And what Macbeth wants to know is his future. So the witches summon apparitions. The first apparition takes the form of an armed head. The second apparition takes the form of a bloodied child rising from the cauldron. And the third apparition is a crowned child cryptically holding a branch. And these three um, apparitions give Macbeth further prophecies about his future. And we're going to go into that in a little bit more detail shortly. Before he goes, however, Macbeth cannot help but want to know more. And of course, what he wants to know about is Banquo and whether the original prophecy that Banquo's children would be kings is true. And so the apparition shows him, or the witches, sorry, I should say at this point, show him a vision of someone who looks a great deal like Banquo rising from the cauldron and then another and another and another and another demonstrating to him this long line of Banquo's relations. At the very end of the scene, he discovers that Macduff has fled and gone to England. And so he is immediately like, ah, that's what I was frightened of, but I know what I'll do. I'll kill all of his family. That'll make things better. Um, so that's the scene in a nutshell. Now let's get on to some language structure and form. OK, so just a couple of moments talking about the witches. We won't go into too much detail. It's important just to recognise that they are spell casting at this moment in the scene. And you can tell that very much, not just because of the semantic field of the supernatural um, in their language, um, but also to do with form. So just as we had in the earlier scenes, we see the witches using trochaic tetrameter. That is the form that makes them seem different to other characters. They don't use prose, they don't use blank verse like the noble characters. Instead, they have their own trochaic tetrameter, which is where you have uh, seven to eight syllables per line with the beat on every first syllable in the foot. So round about the cauldron go in the poise and entrails throat. So it sounds different from the way that um, the other characters are speaking. We also have the fact that they are using rhyming couplets. This is an example for you here. But of course, you also have the very famous rhyming couplet in the scene, double, double, toil and trouble, fire, burn and cauldron bubble, which is a nice one to be able to remember. And guess what, guys? Guess how many times they say that rhyming couplet? Three, that's right, because three is the magic number. So if you're writing on the supernatural, this is a really good spot for you to uh, go to. So I mentioned before that Hecate arrives just at the end of the spell. And you might remember if you looked at my video from um, the end of Act uh, or just before the end of Act 3 that Hecate gets her own scene, which feels really out of place. And it's because Macbeth didn't write it. It's exactly the same here. So if you notice, OK, fine, we've got rhyming couplets, but they're not spell casting anymore. So the rhyming couplets seem weird, seem odd. And actually, if you look at the lexis or the, the words, you know, let's now about the cauldron sing like elves and fairies in a ring. It doesn't really sound like Shakespeare's witches. Uh, so, again, this is an example of a bit of the text that wasn't written by Shakespeare. It was written by Thomas Middleton 20 years ago when the um, style of witches and the way that witches were presented was a little bit more song and dance, uh, a little less evil. OK, last comment on the witches before Macbeth appears. One of, I think, the most powerful moments in this play is delivered by the second witch just before Macbeth enters the scene. And you're going to see it on the next slide. By the pricking of my thumbs, something wicked this way comes. Now, these are witches. The worst of the worst, the baddest of the bad. And they are looking over at Macbeth and saying, 
something wicked this way comes. To them, Macbeth is a source of evil. Macbeth is the wicked one. Note as well here in this indefinite pronoun, fancy word, indefinite pronoun, something. You could just say the word something. It's slightly dehumanizing. They don't say someone wicked this one this way comes no it's something it's almost like Macbeth is less than human because of all of the horrible deeds that he has carried out now whilst we're on the subject of Macbeth let's look at the way that he speaks to them and see if there are any kind of commonalities with the way that he spoke in the past or whether there's been any development in his character okay so here we go <clears throat> this is when he first meets with the witches in this scene I should say look at the way that he talks to them I conjure you by that which you profess however you come to know it answer me okay so first off we're using imperative answer me do what I say so that's very Macbeth and he's done that all the way through I'm pretty interested in this verb though I conjure you Conjure is a word that is very much associated with spell casting. You know, if you conjure something up, it's you make them appear from magic. So even the language that he's using is now closer to that of the witches. OK, we've got this metaphor here um, that builds then into personification. But we've got this metaphor here that reminds us of the enormous power of the witches he says though you untie the winds and let them fight against the churches that's quite a powerful um image there the idea of the winds being let loose and they're battering against churches um a symbol of of god but there it gets even more sort of dramatic when you look at the anaphora which is of course when a word or a small phrase is repeated at the very beginning of a succession of lines and look at how much we have here though you untie the winds though the yesty waves confound and swallow up navigation though bladed corn be lodged and trees blown down though castles topple on their warded heads though palaces and pyramids do slip do you see what i'm saying that there's all of this build up he's giving all of these examples and they are emphasized through that anaphora because what he's really saying is it doesn't matter how powerful you are despite how much destruction you bring so that's what all of these all of these um examples in the list are about it's about destruction you know castles toppling on the warder's head palaces and pyramids are sloping down um and we've got you know obviously this personification so the yesty waves swallow navigation up so take away any control from from sort of man so he's saying even though your power does all of these things yeah until the point that destruction sickens again a nice bit of personification answer to me to what i ask of you okay so we've got the semantic field of destruction building up here okay but he doesn't care so he's saying even though all of this destruction could happen because you would make it happen as dark forces i don't care i'm willing to risk it i'm willing to risk this kind of chaos on earth and of course he is because he's already killed the king and created disorder in the world but again it shows us i think there's a real escalation here okay in terms of what he's willing to chance it's not just his own consequences it's the consequences to the world okay let's see what the um witches tell him okay so the first apparition appears this is the one that has got the armored head and it suits it fits the uh the prophecy because it's uh Macbeth 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 beware Macduff beware the thane of Fife dismiss me enough okay so I've popped some critical terminology up here for these prophecies because they're very easy to remember so they're really good quick wins if you're analyzing in the exam if you can remember these you can still get your critical terminology in there as well so we've got triadic repetition because we've got three of them okay we've got exclamatives we've obviously got repetition and we've got imperatives so there's very much a sense that the apparition here seems to be the one in control um and in this moment Macbeth is like ah yeah got you nice one I, I thought that I needed to be a bit wary of Macduff and as always he wants to know more one word more 
but the apparition goes. So he's left kind of on tenterhooks. I need to know more about Macduff. But apparition one just reaffirms what he already thought was the case. Apparition two, the bloodied child, okay, that rises. Now, this is what the bloodied child says. They say, or she says, or he says, be bloody, bold, and resolute. Laugh to scorn the power of man, for none of woman born shall harm Macbeth. So notice what we've got, got going on here. So we've got this wonderful triad that includes a lovely bit of plosive alliteration that really kind of enhances the violence of these words. What this apparition is saying is you don't need to worry about consequences. You can be as uh, bold, as out there, as violent as you want. You can laugh like be scornful, be disdainful of fellow man because they're beneath you. And then you get the, the crux of the um, prophecy, which is no one can harm you if they were born by a woman. So Macbeth, well, look at what he says. He's using rhetorical questions. He's like, Phew, what need I fear of thee? You know, it's almost quite cocky in the way he sounds. Yet at the same time, he still says, but you know, I'm going to kill him anyway. Uh, even though I don't need to fear you, I may as well just do it. Just double, du you know, assurance double short, just to make doubly certain. Um, and he almost says that he's going to do it just to prove a point, that I may tell pale-hearted fear it lies and sleep in spite of thunder. So that pers personification he's saying here, I'm going to do it anyway, just so I can say, hey, see, see, I didn't need to be frightened of him after all. OK, so he's feeling very, very confident in this moment but still considering bloodshed. Third apparition coming your way. Okay. So again, we have um, a similar kind of style of apparition. We're still in imperatives. We're still using triads, but we've also got this zoomorphic metaphor here, be lion metal. Zoomorphia is when you create imagery comparing people to animals, okay? So, He's basically saying, have the strength and the valor and, and, and the power of a lion in what you do. Um, and take no care who chafes, who frets, or where conspirers are. So there's our little triad. And note there, chafing and fretting, it's like, don't worry about anyone who's getting in your way or is an irritant, or don't be worrying about whether or not there are conspirers. He's basically saying, you don't need to worry about any enemies at all because Macbeth shall never vanquish be until great Burnham Wood to hide Dunsinane Hill shall come against him. So he's basically saying, not only will you not be harmed by anyone that was born by a woman, so limiting those choices, but you'll also never be killed until a great big forest stands up and walks over to you. And it does the trick because Macbeth, well, he's he's happy um who can impress the forest bid the trees on fix his earthbound roots so again personification you no one can tell a forest what to do and then the exclamatives here at the end really demonstrate almost how celebratory he feels almost like he's shouting it's sweet bodeman it's good you know like he's like yes it's all going my way i don't need to be frightened anymore now all of this is really, really um, useful stuff, just as it is. You've got the meaning, you've got the critical terminology, but if you want to push yourself a little bit higher, take note of this next slide. Fancy words to do with tragedy. So two really important terms for this scene. You may remember them from the video that I did in um, on Act 1, Scene 2. If not, don't worry, but there's more information about tragic conventions um, on that one, so do go and have a look if you wish. Hamasha is the first term that I want to talk to you about. Now, this is the tragic flaw. What's a tragic flaw? It's the negative character trait that the hero has that is the reason for everything going south. So in Macbeth's case, it is his ambition. If it weren't for his ambition, he would have never carried out the, the heinous acts that he does. And the very fact that he is back here with the witches, who were the ones that kind of gave him the first push, on his ambition, Lady Macbeth following up swiftly behind, is that sign that, you know, Macbeth is never really happy with his lot. He's always worrying. He's always wanting more security or more power. That's one of the reasons that he's there. Perhaps 
more important to this scene is this other word which may be completely new and that is hubris. Hubris means extreme overconfidence or pride that usually comes directly before the tragic demise of the character. So just before everything goes wrong, they have this moment of going, I'm so great, no one can stop me. And this is the moment for Macbeth. And it happens because the witch's prophecies incite this feeling, i.e. make him feel it. The witches deliberately make him uh, feel so powerful that he, he he feels invincible like nothing can ever stop him okay and from this point forward you're going to see this this idea that it doesn't matter nothing matters anymore because no one can stop him now so the the witches have incited his hubris Okay, and if you want an example of hubris, just have a little look at this bit here. So, first of all, um, we do have this kind of feeling um, that Macbeth, again, he's never sort of sated. He's never comfortable. He always wants to know more. And in this case, he wants to know about Banquo's children, Banquo's issue, a little metaphor there for his children. Will they ever reign? And the witches are like, no, don't, all the apparitions are like, no, don't, don't ask anymore. You don't need it. Here's an example of his hubris. Here's an example of his absolute overconfidence and his feeling of invincibility. Despite the fact that these are supernatural creatures and clearly more powerful than this, look at what he says to them. Deny me this and an eternal curse fall on you. What? He thinks that he can curse witches and their apparitions? He's become so completely caught up in his own power that it's almost laughable, the idea that he would be able to curse. Now, Shakespeare is being quite sneaky here because, again, just like at the beginning of the scene when he said, I conjure you, it's aligning him more closely with the supernatural, i.e., with evil. It also shows that their plan is working. He's completely and utterly caught up in it all. Okay, in the end, they do show him this little um, extra uh, sight of the future to do with Banquo. And this is quite a clever little moment um, because, you know, contextually, there's some quite useful um, allusions here to King James. But first off, we'll have a think about just some of the devices that are being used here. Because again, this is quite a quick win. If you struggle sometimes with finding devices, this is a really great one. First of all, you can see that he's using exclamatives or Shakespeare's using exclamatives, demonstrating the kind of heightened passion of Macbeth in this moment. It's also imperative when he shouts down at him, as in get away, get down. He's, he's frightened by what he does, what he sees. We've also got this really gruesome metaphor, thy crown does sear mine eyeballs. Um, ages ago, he looked at his hands and he said, what hands are these? They pluck out mine eyes. And that was very much to do with his own behaviour. That was in Act 2, Scene 2. Um, but here, it's, it's Banquo's crown that is causing him that kind of pain in his sight. Um, we've got rhetorical questions here. What will the line stretch out to the crack of doom? Um, again, this kind of sense of disbelief that it could it possibly go on any further, and that's heightened by the hyperbole to the crack of doom. Notice it's not like to the end of the earth, it's to doom, which suggests that he only ever sees things ending almost like apocalyptically. Now look at also the numerical listing. So first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth. So again, just emphasizing just how many of Banquo's descendants are sort of coming up um, in front of him in this moment. Here's the exciting little moment here, really, really great for your essays contextually. So um, this, the twofold, the twofold balls and treble scepters, uh, this is the twin orbs of the English and Scottish crowns and the scepters of English, Scot Scotland and Wales. So this is drawing attention to the fact that King James came because King James was already King of Scotland. And when he came, he united all three, um, becoming King James the first of England, but it was the first time that they were all united. Now, it's been proved now that King James wasn't a descendant of Banquo, but at the time Shakespeare wrote this, he really, truly thought he was. So this is a really good doffing the cap to the king who's hopefully sat in the audience watching this. 
Okay, and then just last little bit, lovely plus of alliteration for the blood bolted Banquo smiles upon me and points at them for hits. So that, that really emphasizes his rage because in this moment he, he almost thinks that the ghost, not ghost, the the future Banquo's almost mocking him, are taunting him. One might argue that it is, of course, the witches that are really doing the taunting. Okay. Uh almost through so consequences are immediate in this moment so as soon as the witches disappear off Lennox uh, appears and tells Macbeth Macduff has done one has left fled for England so Macbeth is gutted because he wanted to kill him yeah from this moment the very first things of my heart shall be the first things of my hand he feels that he has spent two time kind of faffing about waiting around he's like oh next time the first time something comes into my head I'm going to do it hubris he feels invincible, so now he doesn't think that he needs to think anything through. Something we've seen from him already, but it's being heightened now. And then the uh, next consequence, he decides, despite the fact that Macduff is not there, the castle of Macduff, he will surprise, note that personification, seize upon Fife, give to the edge of the sword his wife, his babes, and all unfortunate souls that trace him in his line. Okay. Little triad there, wife, babes, that's pretty bad already. And then basically anyone who happens to be linked to him in any way. He wants to eradicate the Macduff line. This is horrible, obviously, because it is needless cruelty. But there is this kind of sense of his own dissatisfaction. He doesn't have any line. He doesn't have any children. He has no one to pass the throne down to. He wants to do the same to Macduff. He wants to ensure that he has no heirs at all. So it's incredibly cruel, but it ties directly into that second prophecy. Be bloody, be bold, be resolute. Yeah, that's exactly what he's doing here. So yeah, bye bye Macduff family line. Okay, sorry quite a chunky scene here for you but it's so important so obviously in our themes we've got the idea of the supernatural um, both in the way that Macbeth speaks but also with the witches and the apparitions clearly we have consequences consequences of his actions um, and the consequences of the witches prophecies ambition massively fueled evil 100% something wicked this way comes it is so clear here that Macbeth has transferred completely over to the dark side. There's no good left in him. And that can be shown through that exceptionally needless cruelty uh, and the needless deaths of the Macduff family. And I've put tragedy on here as a reminder, because if you want to talk about tragic conventions, this is the scene to do it in. Because I will say it one more time, the witches incite the hubris of Macbeth. That's it from me. I hope that was useful. If you haven't subscribed, please do so. Drop me a line in the comments if you've got any questions or any requests. But for now, that's from me saying thank you for watching and happy revising.